I always forget about that. Is that so they can trim the recording? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, hopefully it's okay if it's like not the the cohort leader who does it. But we figured it. Okay, I will share. Yes, I did. Um, try to update the slides. I kind of ran out of time towards the end. Um, but uh, this is my first time like doing a presentation or anything for a book club. So if you have any like suggestions on how to sort of fix things up or anything, they are welcome. Sure, yeah. Happy to keep it casual. Yeah. Um, all right, so the general housekeeping keeping items that were there is obviously feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, I'll probably take out that second point because I think in the previous version of this book, they discussed the grammar of graphics sort of in this chapter. Um, but now that's discussed later on in the book. So they kind of like try to give you a head start on just like using ggplot, just like get up and go kind of thing. And then you learn the theory later. Um, obviously you would learn best if you actually facilitate one of the discussions and doing the chapter exercises is also a good learning opportunity. So the objectives for this chapter was basically, it was just a brief introduction to stuff you can do with ggplot that you probably already want to do. Um, so we were introduced to the key components of every plot, which are the data aesthetics and geons. We learned how to add additional variables with aesthetics, learned about faceting, learned a few different geons learn how to modify the axes, and learn how to save the plot to disk. So basically, ggplot2 was built on the underlying theory of the grammar of graphics, but that theory in and of itself will be introduced later. This is just sort of the quick, like, all right, let's, let's make some plots. Let's go. And this chapter, and presumably a lot of the future chapters, will use the MPG dataset, which comes pre-installed with ggplot2. And this is just uh, a tipple with all the data, all the data. Uh, basically, it's got a number of different um, variables related to car models, which is entirely foreign to me um and these are things like um miles per gallon so fuel efficiency measures in both city driving and highway driving uh engine displacement in liters whether or not the vehicle is front wheel real rear wheel or four wheel drive the actual model of the car as well as its class so like it's a two-seater an suv compact pickup all that stuff. And there were some exercises in this section. Um, did, did you have any questions about the exercises there? It definitely took a little interpretation because I was like, what are these car terms? Um, but yeah. I guess I don't know the answer to number two. How can you find out what other data sets are included with ggplot2? Um, and I'm sure I could Google it, but like, is there a general principle for how you figure out what data sets are included with any package? Uh, you know, I don't know. That was actually one of the questions that I also wanted to ask, um, because my instinct would be to like go into the help files for ggplot too, like just like the introduction and see if it has like a listing of the data sets. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it does. Um, so I'm just gonna like, I just opened, I've, while you're talking, I was opening a, an art studio project um, to go with this book. Um, so now I'm doing like question mark, question mark, ggplot2, which doesn't, I mean, it gets me to the main vignette. Um, mm -hmm. Data 
Uh, what about data parentheses? Did you plot to? No, that does not work. I'm going to Google it. How to find which data sets. Oh, what? <laughs> that sounds, that's wrong. <laughs> Google is lying to me. Is which... it? Is it Google's AI? It doesn't appear to be, but oh. it might be. It says that the command data parentheses will list all the data sets in loaded pack. Oh, oh, in lo in any loaded packages. Okay. Yeah. So that is true, but that doesn't really help me. I'd like to see just the ones. I ah, uh, use, no, that doesn't work. Get a list of all the data sets in a particular package. So I bet data says it loads the data sets or lists. Okay, I got it. I can... Ah, I figured it out. It's data parentheses package equals ggplot2. Mm, gotcha. Wow, there's so many that I didn't know about. Like mammals sleep. Oh, cool. <sighs> Stupid Zoom. The little like when you're sharing Ah, yes. It's... The uh, the little like share bar always always goes in the wrong spot. I know everywhere you want it to be, and it it's so hard to move. Yeah, it's. Uh, I wish they'd put it like vertical. Maybe there's a way to do that. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was my only question that I had in the exercises, though. I mean. To be honest, I wasn't sure about number four, but I also like am not invested enough in cars to really <laughs> yeah. dive into it. So oh, yeah. I had uh, had no idea that there are all of these data sets included. Love colors. How exciting. <laughs> um yeah. The thing with these particular exercises is they feel very much like this is a like a sequel to R for Data Science. Uh -huh. If you haven't read R for Data Science, you're like, what? Right. <laughs> Don't do not understand. Um, but. If you have, they're they're all sort of like basic, just like data exploration questions, and or do you understand cars questions? <laughs> um. All right. So next, we're introduced to the sort of three key components of every plot. We've got um the data, so where we are actually drawing our data from, the aesthetic mappings, and the geom functions. So we've got this function here, ggplot, the data is the mpg, the aesthetics are uh, the displacement on the x-axis, the highway highway fuel efficiency on the y-axis, and then our geom is a scatter plot, so geom point. And this is the plot that you get from that. Some things to note here is that um, you can omit the X and Y or X equals and Y equals arguments for the aesthetics call, um, mm -hmm. which is pretty standard um, just because I don't know most people do it. Yeah. Um, it is also standard to include each new command on a new line. This just enhances readability. Um, when you're looking when you're reading your code but if you put for example geom point up here on the same line as the ggplot command that would still function you would mm -hmm. still result in this graph and they do it sometimes in this chapter to better facilitate comparison between two different um, ggplot calls and were there any questions about the exercises in this section I didn't have any questions about these exercises. I was kind of interested in, I was surprised to see that they didn't fully write out the argument names in the initial call. 
Uh, I know that like nobody does when they're um, using these functions, but like I actually find it kind of helpful to when you're first starting to learn to write out like ggplot data equals mpg mapping equals aes blah 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 with all the stuff inside so that you can really understand like what the aes is doing the fact that it is the um it is like what's going into the mapping and that the first thing is what's going into the data um so like i, I understand that but i was just like from a pedagogical standpoint i was a little bit surprised that they didn't start with a complete call yeah um I also find that sort of interesting. I mean, my guess is that we start, they'll probably do that like in, I guess, chapter six, probably when they start talking about maps. Oh, when they're talking more about the theory. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Which, yeah, I mean, I guess it's sort of like a, a pedagogical debate about like, do you want people to be able to to use the thing just out of the box and just like, Yeah. Let's go, or should they understand like what is being done? Because yeah, I mean, I sp I think with the data, it's not as big of a problem because like base R usually the first argument is like what right. the data is using. <clears throat> so I think yeah, as long as you have some familiarity with R, that's kind of implied. Mm -hmm. but I think with the mapping, it's more sort of interesting because even I like having used ggplot but maybe not being a ggplot expert I forget a lot of the time that that aesthetics call is like that that's the mapping argument <laughs> um because I don't I don't have to like elaborate on the mapping that often so yeah. it'll trip me up if I do have to elaborate on it because I'm like oh right this is where the mapping goes um so yeah, no, I think that's an interesting point for sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I didn't have any other questions on these exercises. Um, I do really like that the book is is jumping in more quickly rather than starting with the theory. I'm generally like in favor of that, but it'll be yeah. interesting to get to the theory later. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's definitely good for somebody who, I mean, the the, the people who are going to, do the like read this book or probably already have projects on the go mm -hmm. it's sort of nice to be able to just be like okay I can actually do something and not have to wait until you're like chapters and chapters in before you can actually start playing with your own data yeah exactly um so there are various aesthetic attributes obviously the x and y were aesthetic attributes but color shape and size as well as a number of other things that'll be covered later can also be mapped to variables in the data so as an example, uh, we have the class variable of the MPG data set, and there are seven unique values there, which are listed here. Um, these are just, you know, whether the car vehicle is a compact vehicle, an SUV, a pickup, a minivan, a subcompact, all of these things that don't mean anything to me because I'm not a car person. Um, and one thing we can do is we can just very quickly be tell ggplot, okay, I want each of these classes to be a different color. At this point, we don't care what color it is. We're not gonna fiddle with that. We're just gonna be like, okay, color them. And we do that by adding color within the aesthetics function. So we've got aesthetics here, our X and Y axis, and then we can go color equals class. And basically what that's doing is saying, okay, I want, you to color each of these class, these individual or unique class values a different color. And what that results in is a plot like this, where we've got the same as the scatter plot we've already been working with, but we've now got a legend on the right with a bunch of different colors, each associated to a different class of vehicle. We can also assign fixed colors. So let's say you just like don't like a black scatter plot and you want it to be blue. And the way you do this is you would indicate the color that you want outside of the aesthetic um, and in the geom layer. So here we've got our usual data, our aesthetic, and then in the geom point, 
we will indicate color equals blue and that results in an all blue plot and we don't need a legend because we're not indicating anything special with a color. We're just, we like our blue points rather than our black points. We can also do things like combining shape and color. So you can add some diversity and information to the plot. So here we've got um, both shape and color indicating the same thing. So they're both indicating the um, uh, the drive, drive wheel, drive train, drive thing. Um, whether it's four wheel, front wheel, or rear, rear wheel drive. Um, and so here, each of those are a different color, but they are also a different shape. A more common way to utilize shape and color together would be to potentially have, or uh, maybe not even a more common way, but you could have shape and color indicating different things. Like, I don't know, in an example, trying to think of an example from my own research. Like maybe you would have shape be uh, what family uh, of carnivore something comes from. And then the, uh, the color would be uh, what their diet is or what their locomotor habits are. Um, but actually having these, um, having shape and color assigned to the same variable can also be very useful if you are working in something like grayscale where colors may be hard to differentiate depending on the screen, um, or if you have a color scheme that is not colorblind friendly, then having the shape change in addition will make your, uh, your plots more accessible to a wider variety of people. You can also use size. Um, so here we have the uh, displacement, the engine displacement as uh, a size variable. And basically what's what that is showing is that among the different uh, drive wheels, we've got uh, various different sizes of displacement depending on what the manufacturer is. All right, and then so for these exercises, any questions? Uh, nope, I was good on these. <clears throat> to like remind myself what the... Yeah, I wish I had had time to do these exercises on like my own data sense, but I haven't had a chance yet. Because um, I feel, feel like I'd be able to experiment a a bit more efficiently and thoroughly that way. Yeah, rather than being to try to figure out what the variables represent. Yeah, rather than being like, what is car? Uh, another really useful thing that you can do in ggplot is faceting. And this is creating a graphic that splits the data into subsets and then displays the exact same graph for each subset. Um, this can be really helpful, especially in cases where you have a lot of different um, unique values for a category, which means that if you use color or shape, you start to like run out of unique colors and shapes and it can get really hard to like differentiate between, you know, teal and blue or things like that. There are two types of faceting. You've got grid faceting and wrapped faceting. Wrapped is what is covered here, and then grid will be introduced in the faceting chapter in chapter 16. And we can get an example of faceting here, um, which uh, splits all of, or splits our data set into different classes and then plots the displacement and the highway fuel economy. Uh, for each of those classes. What I really like about having, I mean, other than the fact that you can do this in, in just like three lines of code, arguably one line of code, I guess. Um, the thing that I really love about faceting is that you do not have to worry about the fact that 
R will, will automatically adjust your axes to fit your data <laughs> when plotting different things. So this way you can ensure that everything is comparable easily. You don't have to like set your, or modify your axes, which we'll talk about later or anything like that. And then any questions about these exercises? I just wanted to <clears throat> add to the axis question, to the axis thing. Um, you do know that you can control that, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know that you can control it, but it's just like, it takes more effort to control right. it than just being well, like faceted. <laughs> I didn't mean, I didn't mean like controlling the limits, but like within facet wrap, you can do scales equals free or scales yeah. equals fixed, which is the default. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. I, I mean, I love faceting. It's like faceting is probably my, my like most used ggplot thing. And specifically the axis thing is like really, I, I often find myself actually starting with the default of like scales equals fixed and then deliberately looking at, okay, what if I put it with free axes and comparing the two hmm. because they tell really different stories. And sometimes you want one and sometimes you want the other, depending on the like use case of your data. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think this is like an amazingly powerful feature and does not, you know, the like you said, the fact that you can do it in one line of one additional line of code instead of having to like make little subsets of your data and then like run a for loop which I see people doing all the time and I'm like okay I'm about to change your life by showing you this like <laughs> facet thing it's awesome yeah no it's really good and I think that's a really good point that you can use this um without having <laughs> the axes be the same because I could see that just being a really good use case just when building like publication level figures where you can just be like, okay, this is one figure we go, it does its axes on its own and like, or each axis is independent of the other and all that stuff. Uh, next, we'll talk about some of the very many geoms that you can use. Uh, so obviously we've already been introduced to geom point, which gives a familiar scatter plot, but there are many, many, many others. So we've gotten geom smooth, which fits a smooth the line to the data. Uh, basically, it runs some form of, um, I guess not necessarily some form of a regression, although it might do a regression, like if you do LM or RLM. I don't know if Lowe's like counts if that's officially a regression or if it's just- Yeah, I'm not sure either. Um, and apparently, I have somehow messed up this image, which I don't. I'm not sure what I've done. Anyways, uh, this it just recreates the figure from the book, so don't worry about it. I will fix it for the like final version. I can picture it. <laughs> uh, then we've got our box plots, which generates a very standard box and whisker plot that uses basic summary statistics like median, quartiles, min and max. Um, it will also plot outliers. So you've got your median, your um, 25% quartile, 75% quartile, max and min, and then your outliers will be done in, um, in points. And of course you can, uh, check the help file to actually modify those arguments. Um, you can also use alternatives to a box plot or alternatives for visualizing essentially the same sort of data as a box plot, which are jitter and the violin plot. Jitter basically just adds some random noise to your data in order to better visualize points that are otherwise completely overlapping. Uh, this is really useful when you're looking at things like categorical data where there's only one option for one of your X or Y axes and therefore you're getting a lot of uh, overlap. Or you can look at a violin plot, which is looking at the density of your data and actually um, does a density function, which I am not entirely sure on the mechanics of how that works. But um, I do know that violin plots, while very cool and pretty, are a little bit harder to interpret than <laughs> uh, something like a standard blocks plot. Uh, 
um, if you want to see how values are distributed within a variable, so you have a single variable and you want to see, you know, what the range of of um, values is and how how many data points have essentially the same value. You can use two different options for this. You can have a geom histogram, which is a histogram, um, or the free poly, which generates a frequency polygon. One thing to know with a histogram or a frequency polygon is that it's really important to experiment with the bin width. The defaults are basically never what will be the optimal bin width. Um, it's useful to play around and um, pick bin widths that are relevant to your data set. Uh, in like the ecology example, something that is biologically meaningful is probably useful. Um, uh, and also, um, you don't necessarily have to use static. You don't have to use equal bin widths, um, although you have to be very careful about you know how you're drawing your interpretations and things if you're not. Uh, so an example here, um, we've got our geom histogram. Uh, which is using these using the standard uh, just like it makes 30 bins equally spaced. This is what we get for the highway fuel efficiency. So we can see two peaks. Uh, we can also visualize the same data with a frequency polygon. And it looks like that. Basically, these are identical. They're just one of them is drawn with bars and the other one is drawn with lines. Um, Do you know yeah. the difference between, or or I guess I'm sort of seeing the difference between <clears throat> um, geom freak poly versus geom density? I mean, I guess one is smoothed and one is not, but I've never used freak poly. I've always used geom density and I thought that that was the uh, counterpart to histogram, but I guess mm. I'm not sure why you'd use one or the other. Yeah, that I am not sure. Um, my I want to say that density is more complex mathematically, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah, I mean, this one looks like it's literally just connecting the dots between points, and so it's much more jagged. Um, but I don't, I yeah, it's I literally didn't know this one existed, so um, maybe yeah. I'll start using it. Yeah, honestly, I haven't I haven't actually used either free like frequency polygons or density, mm -hmm. so um, I'm I haven't read into what the difference is, and I think hopefully we should get some mm -hmm. sort of indication about what the differences are in uh, one of the two next chapters, probably. Still can't That's remember. <laughs> Yeah, collective geoms maybe. Yeah, I was just curious. It's it's pretty neat. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think one of the things they talk about, and I'm sure this is probably the case for the density as well, although since I've never used it, I cannot say, is I like that you can use the frequency polygons to better compare across mm -hmm different histograms just like facilitates that comparison so much better than having like a faceted histogram yeah good point because or like a stacked histogram or something yeah. but it's just yeah. Hard to yeah which i which is how i've done it before just because i'm only really used to histograms um all right so our next sort of, of um, option for geoms is geom bar, which generates a bar chart. And it's important to note that this can be performed on unsummarized data, which is just count data, basically like the count of each thing in each um, category, or it can be done on summarized data. So you can look at, you know, compare means, compare effect sizes, things like that using a bar chart. Um, so the example here is this is just like an unsummarized data. Um, 
which compares the displacement uh, the displacement of the engine in different manufacturers. Um, presumably this is the each. Yeah, so this is another one where <clears throat> I have a similar question, like there's GM bar and there's GM call. And I was just Googling the difference and, oh, I see. Okay, GM call is just a wrapper over GM bar. Okay, GM call is a wrapper over GM bar that has already defined stat equals identity. So you can do GM bar stat equals identity, or you can do GM call as a shortcut if you have values rather than, or like if you have summaries rather than values. Um, but yeah, in practice, it seems like they've just chosen to go with GM bar. We then have uh, GM line and GM path, which generate a line chart or a path chart. Um, and both are generally used for time series data. So basically um, here we've got the line chart tracking uh, the unemployment uh, rate over time in the US, I believe. Uh, and then this is the second one is, or is it the unemployment rate? And then this is the duration of how long people were unemployed. Um, what you can do is you can basically draw them on the same plot using geom path. And instead of having time on the x axis, we have time as a color gradient. Um, and the path actually is connecting each data point in sequence that compares the unemployment rate with the unemployment duration. Um, and as we can see, as we get lighter in color, which is further in time, there is sort of more of a disconnect between the two and people are staying unemployed for relatively longer than they did in 1970. Personally, I find this, maybe it's just because I'm not really used to it, but I find this sort of path diagram <laughs> difficult to parse on first view. I kind of like have to really think my way through it. Yeah, same, but also I've never seen something like this before and it's pretty neat. And I, yeah. it makes me want to parse my way through it. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really cool. Um, but it was just like, at, at first glance, I was like, oh, no, I don't understand what is happening. <laughs> um, uh, and then there were some geom exercises. So if you have any questions about those. I did not get to those yet, so okay. we can. We Neither can did I. Trying to, I'm going to look at the exercises right now just to see if any questions sort of pop up off the top. Yeah, I think they're mostly pretty straightforward, but we can agree that if we have any questions, we'll all keep an eye on the Slack and go through those. Um, all right, so in terms of modifying your axes, probably the, the one that everybody will want to do is changing the labels for the X and Y axes using the X lab and Y lab points. So that'll take something like this, where you get the sort of abbreviated versions of uh, fuel efficiency switched up to actually saying city driving in miles per gallon versus highway driving in miles per gallon. And this is done by adding an extra, um, basically an extra line to ggplot, one each for xlab and one for ylab, um, which is quite different from how um base r does it which i suppose is like pretty much just standard for ggplot ggplot is just very different from plotting in base r um 
Uh, you can also remove the labels. So let's say you wanted a plot with no labels at all, um, for whatever reason, you would just put null for xlab and ylab. In addition to changing the labels, you can also change the val or the um, the start and end points of the x and y axes, also known as the limits. So xlim and ylim will do this. So if we have our standard jittered comparison of the drive wheel with the highway fuel efficiency, um, we can reduce this to only include two of the different uh, categories on the x-axis, as well as subset the data on the y-axis. That's cool. I had never seen that done with categorical data before, but that's really Neither good. had I. Yeah, uh, I didn't know that you could do that. Um, one thing that's really important to note is that it basically just transforms, well, not transforms, got to be specific. It basically just makes all of the data that is outside of the limits that you set NA. So this is something important to keep in mind if you're adding additional um, summarizing or statistical analysis in your ggplot call because once these have been transitioned to an NA, they will no longer count in those summaries. Uh, okay, yeah, that's really good to know. And not ideal. Well, maybe ideal. I don't know. Yeah, I am not sure because um, I think we were talking about this last week. Some a bunch of us like I've never really done the like statistical like summarization or anything in ggplot. I've really only ever done it separately. So I I don't know how I feel about that yet. <laughs> yeah, where I've run into this being a problem is if for some reason. Now, I can't really remember why I would want to do this, but let's say that I did like a geom smooth or something um, and then didn't want to show the entire limits, like I wanted to cut off part of it. You can't do that because then the line itself will be yeah. different than it would be otherwise. So yeah, I don't love that. Yeah. Although I'm wondering now if if you do the statistics, like if you call the, those will be something to play with. If you call the, um, the smooth function first before setting the limits, I wonder yeah, if- It doesn't, it unfortunately. Doesn't care. It still cuts it off. Um, but what I'm wondering is like, I've always done geom smooth. I've never played around with like stat smooth or stat summary or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you are more explicit about the line or the summary that you're putting in and then you do the limits, maybe that will behave differently. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, that I'm not sure either. Something to play around with, I guess. Of course, usually if you are making graphs, you probably want to share them. Um, so there's a few ways you can do this. Um, you can start by saving your plot to a variable, which allows it to be called elsewhere in your R environment. Uh, you can then print it. This is especially useful if you're running GG plots. Um, if you're running a for loop, you'll need to actually specify whether you want to print you can also save it to disk using GG save. Um, and one thing that I hadn't done before was describe the structure of a, uh, a GG plot using the summary function, which I thought was pretty interesting that you could just like, you could theoretically, I guess, save the variable to your environment and then like elsewhere like in, a, in another R markdown or something to be like, ah, yes, this is how I constructed that function or whatever without actually having to go back to the original code. Yeah, that's pretty neat. I haven't ever used this, although I theoretically knew that you could like explore the object if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, and then that is the end of the chapter.
All right. Awesome. I love how this is this is working exactly the way I hoped it would, because even in the first chapter, ostensibly the simplest chapter, I still learned like little nuggets of information that I just mm -hmm. had never seen before. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, and that's what I find like really nice about reading these types of books, as long as they're as long as they're well written and like not a slog to get through. Um I find it's generally you always learn at least a little bit even on the things that you think you're pretty well versed in um, yeah totally well thanks for presenting that um even if it was just me but i i appreciated it no problem. Um, and hopefully we'll scare up some more people next time um who's signed up let's see for next time did i say i was doing this probably not